אחת. Got it. Great, so it's uh, really an incredible pleasure to present uh, Shaniqua Williams Roberson to you all today as our visiting faculty and speaker. Um, she has a really interesting story for those of you who are trainees and I think a lot to learn from. She's an epileptologist and a clinical neurophysiologist who's an assistant professor of neurology and bioengineering at the University of Penn uh, at Vanderbilt University. <laughs> she used to be at the University of Pennsylvania. Go ahead. Um, and her work really is a wonderful combination of engineering, medicine, clinical translation, but at the border between neurophysiology, epilepsy, intensive care unit medicine, and cognition. Um, she um, will tell us a bit about how these things combine together to look at cognition and correlates in the intensive care unit. Um, she completed her Bachelor of Science and uh, Master's degrees in engineering at MIT, and then um, went on to a stint in industry where she worked for Oracle, both in California, the headquarters, and then in Paris for a number of years. So if you want her to conduct a lecture in French, I'm sure she could accommodate us. Um, medical school at Cornell, and then she did research with Nico Schiff, really on coma. Um, from there, she did some work with Barry Gordon on electrophysiology in coma at Hopkins. So you can see this kind of combination of engineering cognition, neurophysiology, um, then did a neurology at Johns Hopkins, epilepsy fellowship and instructorship at Penn, and has been at Vanderbilt for a few years now, um, where she's really integrating between engineering and uh, clinical neurosciences. So we're thrilled to have you here, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Well, um, Thank you. It is indeed a pleasure to be here, um, and I appreciate the, the very kind introduction. Um, it is an honor to be asked to speak to this crowd. Um, I really admire some of the lectures that I've heard here uh, through this, uh, this forum, so thank you. Um, I want to talk to you about, uh, you guessed it, delirium. This is a disorder of the mind that we see not too infrequently in the uh, context of medical care, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I guess before I start, I should, or as I am starting, I should acknowledge my sources of funding who have no influence over the uh, data or information that I'll share with you today. Um, but uh, as I'm, this disorder of the mind that I'm referring to is delirium. Uh, the word delirium comes from the Latin word that you see there before you, I'm not gonna to try to pronounce it, <laughs> that uh, was reported to mean out of the furrows or in common parlance today, off the rails. <laughs> it was described in the medical literature about as early as the first century um, to refer to mental disorders that were associated with fever or head trauma. Um, and Today, it's generally defined as an acute confusional state uh, with fluctuating levels of arousal, as well as the deficits in attention and other cognitive domains. And by acute there, what I mean is it sets in over the course of hours to maybe a few days. Although it was originally described in the context of fever or head trauma, delirium can actually be brought on by a number of circumstances. So drug intoxication, sleep deprivation, and as our brains accumulate more birthdays, uh, they also become a little bit more susceptible to developing delirium. This is particularly true in the context of medical illness. As a matter of fact, of about 6 million admissions to the intensive care units in the United States per year, about one quarter of them are complicated by delirium. And historically, we physicians, even us neurologists, um, have thought of this as a benign, unavoidable response to what's going on in the ICU, systemic inflammation, uh, sedation, environmental conditions. Um, but 
as it turns out, delirium is actually um, a brain a brain failure, just like kidney failure or lung failure, and it pretends worse prognosis in our ICU survivors. It's associated with uh, higher rates of mortality, worse cognitive outcomes after critical illness, and longer lengths of stay, higher costs of care, longer time on the mechanical ventilator, independent of other, uh, other potentially confounding factors. And so it's become more and more recognized as something that is important to, dis uh, important to study and understand and important to try to monitor for and try to limit in terms of its occurrence. Um, although lots of people have tried to study it over the course of decades now, there's still a lot that we don't understand about it. And so my goal today is to uh, encourage folks to be thinking about delirium as a potential um, entity to study and maybe add your expertise to this, uh, this need of, of understanding it and trying to limit it. Um, as I think that that would significantly impact the, uh, the outcomes of a lot of people. So specifically my goals today will be to first discuss the many mechanisms by which we believe delirium to occur, um, describe some of my own work in terms of improving the tools that we use to identify its presence, and then explore possible pathophysiologic links between delirium and long-term cognitive decline. And I'm gonna approach these questions primarily through the lens of electroencephalography, EEG, for two main reasons. One is because EEG turns out to be a really practical modality in which to study delirium, particularly in the intensive care unit. Two, because I'm an electrical engineer, as you heard by training, and I love the idea of being able to do signal processing to uh, study um, disorders of the mind. So let's get started. First, let's talk about delirium pathogenesis. One way to understand pathogenesis of, the, of delirium is to look at the manifestations thereof and try to understand what are the neurologic or neurobiological or neuroanatomical mechanisms by which those manifestations occur. So what are the manifestations of, of delirium? Primarily, as I mentioned before, it is a disorder of arousal. Um, people often have fluctuating levels of consciousness. They can be, you know, hanging from the ceiling at one point. Uh, they can be completely sedated and, and difficult to arouse at another point. When they're very difficult to arouse, we call that hypoactive delirium. When they're agitated and, and difficult to uh, redirect, we call that hyperactive delirium. And then there's, of course, a mixed delirium where, where we're seeing both conditions at any given time. In addition to fluctuations in arousal, um, we often see disorders of attention. People are just not able to focus, not able to, to stay engaged in the conversation. Some of that is due to difficulties with arousal, but there's also a completely separate component of attention. And so we think that attention mechanisms are, or, or networks that are implicated in attention, such as the prefrontal networks, are, are probably impacted by delirium. In addition, many people who experience delirium um, report distorted perceptions. They're seeing things that are crawling on the walls. They're um, seeing objects, but seeing them differently, uh, perhaps you know, bigger or wider, or, or they're, they're feeling things that are not, uh, not normal to them. Um, and when they remember these things, they ascribe, um, I guess, reasons for these these sensations that are that are not uh, that are not normal, that are not um, not natural, and and not likely to have occurred. And and this is very disturbing for a lot of people, a lot of ICU survivors in particular. There's obviously, and I've, I've just alluded to this a little bit, um, disturbances in memory. People have a really hard time 
remembering even the simplest things, short-term memory. And then they also sort of have um, long-term memories that tend to be intrusive to their current state. They have a really hard time distinguishing time and what happened before, what happened after. Particularly among, with their sort of factual or semantic memory, but also with episodic memory and kind of what has gone on uh, with them. And then there's the source of emotion and that sort of involves the limbic system, uh, impl implicates anyway, the limbic system and, and the uh, amygdala in particular. Um, and uh, many times uh, patients with delirium have uh, impaired or, or I would say altered um, assignment of valence to individual situations and, and conditions. And by valence, what I mean is essentially the uh, assignment of a positive or a negative experience to things. So given the breadth of manifestations and the networks that are probably involved in all of these, and the fact that typical cases of delirium typically present with at least two or three of these manifestations, it's reasonable to think of delirium as a global neurocognitive disorder that's affecting either all cognitive networks simultaneously, although perhaps not equally, or at the least many of them. <clears throat> and that suggests that the pathophysiology of delirium is the, you know, the driving factor of delirium is really something that's got to be more of a global influence, um, either at the cellular or molecular level, i.e., you know, the neurons that are firing or the molecules that are influencing the neurons that are firing. And indeed, when we look at the conditions that increase risk for delirium in the ICU, um, for the most part, these are things that affect the brain at the cellular and molecular levels. It could occur in a presence of a wide variety of factors, and we like to divide them up between predisposing factors, which are you know, factors that are uh, present when the person rolls into the critical care unit, versus precipitating factors, things that um, are um, happen while they're in the ICU and, and, and particularly things that we might be able to intervene on modifiable versus non-modifiable. So I won't go through the entire list here, but examples, um, drugs, sedatives, immobility and pain, um, respiratory failure, which is uh, inability for the lungs to transfer oxygen correctly or, um, and shock and ability for the heart to to uh, pump eff efficiently and effectively. Here's a schematic of some of the postulated mechanisms by which these predisposing and precipitating risk factors could lead to delirium. So an ob obvious example, as I mentioned, is the drugs. Where is my mouse? I could point there, yes, okay. Um, medications in particular, anticholinergic drugs, antihistamines, um, they will influence the ascending arousal systems that use acetylcholine and, and histamine to uh, communicate. And so they could precipitate delirium, particularly in folks who are predisposed to, to such a condition. Then there are GABA, ag GABA agonists, excuse me, so uh, drugs that potentiate the major inhibitory neurotransmitter of the brain, right? Um, and that certainly can drive that inhibitory tone in widespread spread areas around the brain. These types of drugs are known to contribute to delirium, especially, like I said, in, in brains that are predisposed, especially in brains that are predisposed by neurodegenerative disease or other elements of frailty. Respiratory failure and shock will result in impaired oxygenation of the blood or impaired blood flow, and that reduces the metabolic supply to the brain, the, the energy supply to the brain. And an important but somewhat perplexing example, at least for me, is systemic inflammation, sepsis. And so I would say sepsis, which is a systemic infection and the inflammation that is, uh, is induced by it, by this infection. 
because it triggers secretion of inflammatory cytokines. These are little molecules that tell your immune system to kind of rev up to, to mount a defense against the infection. Although the infection may be localized and maybe in a completely different part of the body, these inflammatory cytokines circulate throughout the body, including the brain. But it's not quite clear how that actually precipitates delirium. Um, it's, possibly, it's possible that it doesn't do so in isolation, um, but rather coupled to a predisposed brain. Um, for example, maybe the brain itself is compromised because of blood-brain barrier dysfunction or some prior insult like a stroke. There are a number of other factors. I'll gloss over them for this audience. But the one thing I want to end with here is that all of these changes are thought to in some way lead to a final common pathway of disrupted neuronal signaling and reduced integration of neur neuronal brain networks, multiple networks that are required to support normal brain function. And yes, I'm waving my hands here a little bit because as you can probably tell, we don't know a lot and there's a lot, still lots to learn. But observations in support of this have led to this so-called systems integration failure hypothesis by which basically you've got some neurotransmitter dysregulation and or some network, this is network disconnectivity or network dysfunction, and you essentially get disintegration of the entire system, the entire brain system. It's unclear whether this is um, disruption of a single network, a single region that could be necessary or sufficient for delirium development, but um, because it's likely that uh, by the time folks come to clinical observation, by the time we discover that they're delirious, multiple networks have already been involved. Um, but it is likely that these patterns are um, coming from different angles and they lead to different sort of patho, uh, pathological sort of pathways that end up having similar clinical features and they broadly fall into this delirium bucket, but they're different disorders. So my key takeaway number one is that delirium pathogenesis is heterogeneous. There's lots of different pathways and it affects multiple cerebral networks, but maybe not uniform. Probably the biggest key takeaway number one is that we still don't know a lot about delirium pathogenesis and there's lots to learn. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about delirium biomarkers. And this is based on um, a lot of work for decades that has shown that we can use what we know about normal, uh, uh, normal um, systems of oscillations of, of brain activity, of electrical activity of the brain uh, to identify when we are seeing pathologic activity in terms of uh, electrical transmission of the brain. And that's using the EEG. It's important to identify delirium because as I mentioned, it could be an early sign of some new complication in the ICU. Um, and uh, during delirium, people have limited uh, ability to, um, limited, limited capacity, I guess, to make decisions for themselves or even communicate other problems that they may be experiencing. Um, and then early intervention uh, of delirium might actually help us identify, uh, improve some of the delirium outcomes. Currently, the standard of care for monitoring delirium, according to the Society for Clinical Care Medicine, is the bedside exam, i.e. you look at a person, you talk to them, you ask them questions and find out if they're delirious. Um, but that standard is not applied uniformly across ICUs. It's actually fairly difficult in some settings, particularly when nurses are overburdened already with uh, lots of other things to do. Um, it's, it's not always practical to make sure that they are routinely and systematically uh, assessing for delirium. And in practice, they often do not. So how can we use an age-old tool, electroencephalography or EEG, to help us uh, to measure delirium. That's what I'm going to talk to you about now. But as a backup, that, taking a step back from that, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about EEG. Most of you are already familiar, fairly aware, so I'm 
going to be brief on this, but for those who don't know, EEG measures voltage fluctuations from large groups of neuron in the brain. You can see that this is a cross-section of a skull, the scalp, um, the dura, the layers over, overlying the uh, brain cortex, and then the brain cortex itself with pyramidal cells that uh, have um, postsynaptic uh, potentials that are um, dipoles that are generated by postsynaptic potentials in these pyramidal cells, the ones that are oriented perpendicularly to the brain surface. Our EEG electrode measures the voltage fluctuations from large populations of these neurons and thereby, thereby can give us some information about what's going on in the brain. Clinically, when we use the EEG, we are basically measuring a graph of voltage, these voltage fluctuations over time, and we're looking for specific patterns. Um, and we measure this in multiple areas around the brain. The typical clinical EEG in the ICU is going to be about uh, 19 channels um, for 19 electrodes. And as you can see, each one has its own location. The even numbers are on the right, the odd numbers are on the left. You can imagine that this is a big head with the left ear there, the right ear there, the nose up there. So, um, and then each of these codes represents a different location, frontal, central, T for temporal, P for parietal, et cetera. And so all of these squiggly lines uh, can help us identify what's going on in the brain at any given time. We particularly are looking for uh, uh, fluctuations in time of the voltages in, in different frequency bands that are of particular interest. So canonically, there are six different frequency bands that we're particularly interested in, five of which are shown here. Um, we name them based on essentially the order in which they were originally identified. But let's suffice it to say that down here, you've got delta waves that if this is one second, they fluctuate over maybe one to four times per second. Um, and that's often seen in deep sleep, but can be seen in delirium. Uh, these little fast bursts here are sleep spindles, which I'm sure lots of folks have heard of. Um, theta activity is seen very frequently in drowsiness. Alpha activity oscillates at about 8 to 13 hertz-ish and uh, is seen during relaxed wakefulness. Um, and then the beta activity at the top <laughs> is very fast frequency that is often seen in the frontal regions during, um, during cognition or in relaxed wakefulness. And so with this, we can look for these patterns, and this is what we do often clinically, looking, for example, if you can see here, there are these codes and these identify the locations that we're recording from. And so in the posterior regions, we have this alpha activity during, you know, in a period where someone's relaxed and awake um, and perhaps with their eyes closed. Whereas in the frontal regions, we have faster frequency activity with maybe a little bit of overlying artifact from muscle. That's then changed a little bit during sleep where there's less of this anterior to posterior gradient of frequencies, but rather a little bit more predominance of delta activity here that if this is one second, you can see sort of fluctuations over the course of that second in a very slow pattern. Um, and then occasional, what we call K-complexes, these big deflections with sleep spindles associated with them that kind of shows what sleep looks like on an EEG, and then delirium. Here's one example of what delirium can look like on an EEG on a patient who actually was delirious, um, where there's a complete loss of any of that architecture that I was describing to you before. There's a lot of delta activity um, and uh, a lot of sort of random activity, including a lot of muscle artifacts that you kind of have to read through. And there can also be some transient, um, transient, uh, uh, waveforms that, that pop up at bed. Oops, did I go too far? Uh, and people can even, um, you can even see uh, EEG, specific types of patterns of EEG in, in folks who have coma. 
As a general rule, the EEG signal is a mixture of all of these frequency bands, and they wax and wane in terms of their contribution. But importantly, oops, I thought I made this. Anyway, importantly, delirium, as I showed it to you, can actually manifest in multiple ways. So these all are EEG patterns that all are, are folks who were in delirium when the EEG was recorded. Um, and they all look slightly different. And so the idea of using the EEG to identify delirium is um, relatively easy if you're looking at the EEG um, and if you're trained to look at EEG uh, in terms of the actual voltage fluctuations. But if you wanted to do it in sort of an automated fashion, um, it's not exactly trivial um, because uh, teaching a computer to recognize all of these patterns um, uh, needs to be done carefully, if you will. So, um, but it is doable. Um, so that is the, uh, the idea behind the study that I'll show you next. The um, central hypothesis of this study was that there are objective neuro neurophysiological signatures, signatures on the EEG, that are specifically signatures of ICU delirium and, and can pick out ICU delirium separate from sleep, for example, or separate from wakefulness. Um, and that those signatures re reflect its underlying neural processes and it predict its long-term cognitive function. This study was a pilot study that was done in a set of uh, 25 patients uh, that were recruited in the medical, surgical, and trauma units uh, of the ICUs at Vanderbilt. And we excluded folks who had reasons to have sort of focal abnormalities on their EEG, abnormalities in certain regions of their EEG. We were looking particularly for folks who had sort of a general uh, EEG without uh, changes in specific regions. So we excluded focal epilepsy, people with skull defects or, or people with brain tumors or, or bleeds, major bleeds in certain areas. We conducted continuous video EEG for 24 hours for each of the uh, participants and twice daily delirium assessments using the confusion assessment method for the ICU, CAM ICU, which is a validated method for bedside assessment of the uh, of the uh, of delirium. The EEG recordings themselves, as I mentioned, there were 24 hour EEGs that were done according to uh, standard, standard clinical um, processes um, using NATIS uh, EEG data acquisition system. We initially took five minute segments of these EEGs um, that were um, recorded specifically immediately after any CAM ICU assessment to essentially capture specifically the time frame that uh, was associated with uh, that assessment time period. Uh, we identified, we de-identified the EEGs, we converted them to EDF, did some uh, automatic, art, automated and manual pre-processing of those EEGs, and then performed signal analysis to um, identify spectral components, i.e. Uh, composition of delta, alpha, uh, theta, and beta frequencies, as well as some other um, signal uh, characteristics, such as the variability of the EEG signal, in, uh, in those frequency ranges and some measures of coherence, how well two frequencies um, from either sides of the brain uh, modulate together um, as well, and some entropy measures. This is where I'm supposed to look at my timing and I am doing, okay, what's, it's 11.33, 12.33, okay, all right. So I'll tell you very briefly, um, going through this, we took all of these quantitative EEG metrics. This is just an example. We use multiple imputation, single imputation, excuse me, to, um, to identify any missingness, which we had a, a few that were missing specifically in the, in the coherence uh, ranges because we had to essentially clean the signals from artifact and that would lead us to actually remove some of the uh, individual channels that were too noisy. Um, after that, we used a lasso regression technique, a, a penalized regression technique to um, identify which of the, um, of the quantitative EEG metrics were the most important in terms of 
um, clarifying, distinguishing folks who were uh, in delirium or in coma versus those who were not delirious at all. And we loaded these, uh, these metrics, specifically the selective metrics, into uh, a model that combined with clinical variables was designed to predict delirium or coma. We compared that model with a separate model that only used the clinical variables um, to identify delirium or coma. And then we compared the two models using a likelihood ratio test. So which metrics were identified as the most important? In this group, there were four metrics uh, of which the delta variability, so the coefficient of variation in the uh, delta frequency range in the, that low frequency range um, was probably the strongest. Um, these four characteristics were um, the most ind independently identified the distinction between delirium and, and, and no delirium. And as you can see, when we map them out, uh, the delta variability was much lower in the comatose group versus the delirium group versus folks who had neither. High beta variability kind of had the same pattern. Uh, theta power was another one, relative theta power. So this was ratio of theta power to broadband power and then relative alpha power. Um, and the, I not show, I didn't write this down on my slide, but the uh, uh, by likelihood ratio test and the Aike information criterion, which is just another way of comparing models, uh, the model with these metrics did better in predicting delirium than um, the model without these metrics. So then what we did in a post hoc analysis was actually take these metrics and kind of put them together in a linear combination based on their lasso coefficients um, to, I, to create a sort of composite delirium indicator. And just as a first step for internal validation, um, looked at the performance of that delirium indicator to identify delirium or coma. And not surprisingly, it had a great performance. It, um, if you're familiar with receiver op operator receiving operator characteristic curves, um, this is a curve that um, distinguish or helps you identify the uh, sensitivity and specificity, the potential sensitivity and specificity of a um, of a biomarker or of an indicator. And basically, you know, this if your curve falls on this sort of diagonal line, that basically means that your indicator has a 50-50 chance of uh, doing being um, able to identify the disease process of interest. Um, but as your curve gets closer and closer to the upper left corner here, um, that suggests it has better and better um, performance. And indeed, we had an area under the curve of 94%, uh, which was uh, very good in this small preliminary cohort. Um, certainly not surprising because it was um, developed on the same cohort. Um, just to, for sanity check, we also took the remainder of the EEG. I, if you recall, I, I specifically said that we used uh, just the five minute segments at the time of EEG, sorry, at the time of uh, delirium assessment, but we looked at the remainder of the EEG, the, the 24 hour uh, segments, and we mapped out the delirium indicator over the course of the diurnal cycle. And what we saw is that folks who were never in delirium or coma during that whole 24 hour cycle um, had higher indicator values than those who were always in delirium or coma. And then this line here represents a sample patient who had a mixed um, outcomes in the morning when the person was assessed they were fine. They were not in delirium, but uh, in the uh, when they were assessed in the evening, they uh, did have. They were in delirium, and at least um, a priori, it has face value that uh, this indicator kind of dropped down for this person. We also looked at uh, 
out long-term outcomes or actually intermediate term outcomes. And this was not originally done. This was also a post hoc analysis that was requested by our reviewers. Um, but what we did see was that those who survived at three month outcomes had better, um, had higher indicator values um, than those who died. And this was statistically significant using the Wilcox and Ring sum test. So as I mentioned, this was a fairly small cohort. Uh, our internal, um, internal validation worked well, but how does this work in other cohorts? We applied this uh, EEG delirium indicator to a separate cohort of uh, 74 uh, patients who were over the age of 90 um, who had gotten EEG for clinical purposes. So this was a retrospective cohort. Um, and we looked with multivariable analysis at the, um, the association between this EEG delirium in indicator and the presence of uh, delirium or coma as could be identified. Yes, ma'am, excuse me. We have two questions um, from you. Yes. Um, so it's just, um, do the EEG signals differentiate between hyper versus hypoactive delirium? And then what percentage of the cohort Okay, so first question is, do the EEG signals differentiate between hyperactive and hypoactive delirium? We have not actually done that analysis. Um, that would be an interesting question. My suspicion, um, at least based on, um, based on what I've seen in the, in the sort of, in the time series, is that this delirium indicator would not uh, fare very well as far as that's concerned. Um, I suspect that those with hypoactive delirium um, would have very similar uh, delirium indicator values. But that's that's interesting question and worthwhile to check. What's the second question? Uh, Michelle Johnson asked, what percentage of the cohort died? Oh, um, I have that information and... Uh, 30% of the cohort died. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, so validation in a separate cohort. Um, so hospitalized nonagenarians, the short answer is, and I realize that I am, <laughs> I am talking way too slowly. Uh, the short answer is our EEG delirium indicator did, uh, uh, was independently associated with presence of delirium or coma. Um, Folks who had a one point decrease in their EEG delirium indicator were 14 times more likely to be in delirium or coma at the time of the, the EEG. And this was independent of history of dementia as well as other covariates that we, uh, that we added into the model. Um, importantly though, we were interested in this history of dementia because one third of these participants had, approximately one third of these participants, participants had a history of dementia as documented in their, um, in their uh, charts. Uh, and what we identified was that if we stratified the, uh, the cohort by history of dementia versus no history of dementia, you can see here our receiver operator characteristic curves actually um, performed pretty well in those with no history of dementia, but performed abysmally in those with a history of dementia. So um, what that suggests is even if as we go forward and develop this, um, this indicator further, um, it looks like we're going to need different uh, characteristics of the EEG. We're ne going to need to look at different characteristics of the EEG in those uh, with dementia, that they have a whole different set of processes going on. Um, so limitations and future directions about that. So one thing I've already talked about, uh, we need to sort of be more um, discriminating in, in terms of folks with dementia. I'm also very interested in seeing if we can use the EEG to sort of identify the etiologies of delirium. Is the EEG, is there something that is quantitatively measured in the EEG going to be different in drug-induced drug delirium versus delirium due to systemic inflammation versus delirium due to electrolyte abnormalities? And there's another question, tell me. We can use supervised machine learning to develop the model. Oh, very, very good. So we used, <laughs> I would say no. I, I mean, one could, one could call a penalized lasso regression followed by, you know, creation of this. Uh, it, it was kind of a ma very manual version of machine learning, but 
but no, it, we, we could certainly approach it from a machine learning approach, but I think that that would require a lot more, a lot uh, bigger, a lot more, a lot larger data set. Thank you. Um, yes, but I think the most clinically useful um, way of moving this forward is to be able to uh, identify different etiologic subtypes because we could then convert this EEG indicator or some derivation of it into something that actually guides clinical care, right? If I could, most folks nowadays, um, when they have delirium, they probably have multiple reasons to have delirium at one time. Um, but if I can tell you that on their EEG, it's not just about the drugs that you're giving them, but it's about the systemic inflammation that um, that helps drive the you know the uh, guidance to you know not necessarily try to you know switch out certain medications because the medications are the problem, but rather focus in on trying to get rid of that whatever that sepsis is or looking for a, for a septic source that may not have been found thus far. There's other things also that just make it need to make it a pragmatic reality. You can't actually monitor continuously with full head montage EEGs for everybody in the ICU. So we need to make sure that uh, our computations will work with just limited montages, maybe one or two channels. And then I would really like to see wireless EEG recording be a thing so that you know you can also monitor continuously, but your patient doesn't necessarily need to be continuously connected to yet another machine in the ICU. Um, and then there's um, a role of advancing treatment approaches once we identify these, because there's really no clear treatments for delirium thus far, except for non-pharmacologic measures. So that was key takeaway number two, is that EEG could serve as a biomarker for ICU delirium and, and actually be clinically useful. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes talking about Part three, which is the delirium and dementia interchange. Um, and um, I'm glad that people are asking questions and I invite folks in the room to ask questions as well if you, um, if you see fit, um, but we'll also have hopefully a few minutes for questions afterwards as well. So what is the deal with this delirium dementia interchange? Well, I alluded to this before. Um, basically delirium during hospitalization is associated with increased risk of dementia after hospitalization. This has been shown in a number of studies. Um, and what I don't have here is a more recent study in, uh, that was just published last year um, that uh, looked at a, a large cohort of ICU, specifically ICU patients um, and identified um, a, um, mm, I think it was a, a very commensurate number, about 12 fold risk of increased risk of, <clears throat> excuse me, of delirium, a uh, dementia diagnosis within um, one year after, within two years, excuse me, after um, uh, discharge from the ICU. And also there are some, there have been some studies actually out of, out of our institution um, that demonstrated that the dose of delirium, so to speak, i.e. Um, how many days a person spends in delirium during their hospitalization, during their, their acute hospitalization, is uh, independently associated with their formal cognitive, their performance on for, formal cognitive um, testing after, even after adjusting for confounders, again, like severity of illness, um, pre-existing um, pre risk factors for cognitive decline, et cetera. Importantly, these folks that were in this cohort, and there were about 820 folks initially, um, uh, did not have any evidence of pre-existing cognitive decline um, based, on, based on screening tests. It's very difficult to formally test cognitive function in, you know, because you, you can't get the pre-morbid function because you're not planning to be admitted to the ICU. Uh, but these concepts lead to uh, somewhat of a, a model by which we can think of uh, folks uh, entering the ICU during their critical illness and either having one of two trajectories, uh, a, you know, somewhat of a decline in their cognitive function or really precipitous decline in their cognitive function, leading, you know, which is represented by coma or delirium. And then they kind of recover, everybody kind of recovers as their systemic illness gets better. But then 
as they leave the ICU and go to their you know, homes and try to get back to their lives, uh, some continue on a normal path and others uh, develop you know, uh, uh, symptoms consistent with dementia and actually get the diagnoses of dementia. But understanding the mechanisms here and, and uh, the interventions that we can apply to, uh, to uh, stop this trajectory, there, that is open game. We, uh, we have nothing as of yet. Um, and that's what this was about. Um, we don't know how that happens. And so we uh, need to continue the uh, work to uh, understand this. What do we know thus far? Well, there are a couple of things. Um, the same study that I showed you before, uh, we did do, or uh, some of my colleagues did a, uh, a, a nested sub-study and actually uh, gathered MRI data in, uh, in some of those survivors and was able to identify that um, decreased uh, fractional anisotropy in the uh, <clears throat> corpus callosum actually was associated with um, number or inversely, or was associated with uh, days of delirium in the hospital. Did I get this right? I should have put this in the other side. I apologize. Um, was associated with their, um, their, uh, their, sorry, their uh, scores at three months. And then also at their, uh, dis uh, was inversely associated with their um, R-band score, so their uh, glo global cognition score uh, at 12 months. Genu of the corpus callosum, I get it, sorry. And then that suggests that maybe this white matter, this sort of interhemispheric white matter uh, connections are important and maybe related to the, uh, the decline that we see after delirium, the cognitive decline we see after delirium. This was supported later by uh, um, a a study of those subset of those participants who had received EEG, again, for clinical purposes uh, in the ICU. Um, and we basically looked at, uh, we looked at uh, spectral features of their EEG and uh, correlated those with um, performance on, in specific cognitive domains in their long-term outcomes. And we looked at their global cognitive function as well as performance in their visual spatial constructional um, domains and delayed memory domains. And we specifically chose these domains because they were the most impaired and because they had the widest range uh, where we could actually look for, a, uh, look for uh, correlations. Um, and what we saw was that the relative alpha power in the, uh, in the, in the, during the hospitalization was, a, was a, predictive or correlated with, that did not predict, but correlated with their visual spatial constructional um, function at 12 months, and that both their coherence, their inner hemispheric coherence, uh, as well as their uh, variability in that delta frequency range were inversely correlated. So the red means inversely correlated and the blue means correlated. So, um, so that does give some more support to the idea that um, this disruption in white matter tracks and perhaps this functional disconnectivity between uh, the hemispheres may be, uh, may be important to the uh, association between delirium and dementia. Um, but what is perplexing here, to be honest, is that the, um, the variability in the, in the delta frequency range is actually associated with worse cognitive outcomes, um, whereas this variable was actually uh, a very, you know, strong component of our EEG delirium indicator, and and in in the e, in the acute setting, uh, the delta variability was associated with better brain function. So what we think is happening is a uh, a U shaped relationship where there's a there's a peak delta variability that's good, and then once you kind of get to that peak, uh, those survivors that have have gotten to a pretty high value of the delta variability, um, they, you know, the, the other end is, is maybe you don't want too much, if you will. Um, there is more to learn there. And we are looking at a larger cohort to uh, just try to parse this out a little bit better. Last thing I will say is that uh, 
again using EEG, but also combining it with other modalities. I'm very excited to note that there uh, are emerging animal models that um, try to model the idea of delirium. And of course, everybody in the room should be saying, what? Animal models of delirium? <laughs> How do you test a, a mouse to see if they've got delirium? How do you test whether they're confused or not? Um, but um, a work by my colleague, Fiona Harrison, um, and some of her students has uh, demonstrated a mouse that uh, if you give it an, uh, an infection, basically, in the peritoneum, uh, in the belly, uh, they my, mice do poorly. And you're actually able to, to test them on a certain number of, uh, of variables that sort of measure their first, their how sick they seem to act. They call it a, a sickness behavior. But that seems to improve. In within the first few days, but then also test them later on on their ability to do more complex cognitive functions. And uh, she used EEG to also where is the EEG? So she used EEG during the during the acute illness, and then also measured EEG later on um, after they came out, or you know after they recovered, as well as much later in the in the time course. And was able to demonstrate that there were there were EEG findings uh, with EEG findings that were suggestive of delirium, mouse delirium, if you will, uh, with changes in their delta power and, and theta power, um, that uh, that that suggested that those mice were delirious and that um, and correlated with their um, performance in just building neat nests. Uh, at, uh, at the outcomes. So we're really excited about potentially the possibility of using this and other mice mo mouse models to help clarify delirium and also its relationship to the subsequent development of dementia. So you made it. <laughs> uh, bringing things to a close, I hope I've been able to share with you a little bit about what we know or what we don't know about uh, delirium pathophysiology. It is heterogeneous and affects multiple cognitive networks, probably at a cellular molecular basis, um, but more is to be learned and would be very useful to learn. EEG can be used as a biomarker for delirium, um, specifically quantitative analysis, computerized analysis of EEG, and can actually be clinically useful if we keep moving forward with that, <clears throat> with that analysis. And then last but not least, EEG and possibly combined with other technologies might actually help us to understand and clarify a little bit the relationship between delirium and dementia. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'd like to thank all my, oh, um, yes, sorry. sorry. Um, you mentioned the idea of a single channel EEG monitor. Which EEG channel channels would you suspect may um, be the most sensitive to your delirium? Ah, very good question. So there's two considerations there. One is what's most sensitive, and then there's what's most practical. Because if we're talking in our ICU patients, um, they've got a lot going on. Um, they're being moved all around. If they're delirious, they're, they also may be moving around in a kind of an uncontrolled fashion. And um, they maybe going for tests, they may have other monitors on them, et cetera. Um, so my suspicion is that something that's out of the way of everything else will be the best location. So I'm really interested in the midline, frontal, and parietal regions. Um, as it turns out, uh, some colleagues in the Netherlands have, have done some studies about, about this just in terms of their own markers and, and also identified that the parietal region in particular seemed to um, be very sensitive to, uh, to biomarkers of delirium. Most of the limited montage EEGs that are being used to these days though are, are montages across the, uh, across the forehead. And that's just because uh, that's what's clinically available in, um, in the ICU and also in the anesthesia space where a lot of interest is in this. Um, but the frontal regions are certainly very impacted, you know, 
as we talked about attention and um, and other cognitive functions. So that could also be quite sensitive, but I think that it's not gonna be as practical. Yes, Roy. Thanks for the talk. So uh, yeah. talking about the gene markers of what might be present during the day. And I'm, I'm trying to suss out in my mind whether or not like, what's happening is the strength of like, you know, a few morbid vulnerability, but then something's happening, or is it just no what was happening in, in, in that moment? So can you talk a little bit about what we know, uh, if anything, about what happens both to the left and to the right of that acute time in the timeline, right? Like if yeah. it's specific EEG on everyone, mm -hmm. they all think they come at the ice cream concert, would there be some signal that you think if we could predict which people are going to have delirium? Mm -hmm. And then correspondingly, if we could follow those people out after their delirium resolved, like you know, maybe some subset of them are more at risk of cognitive decline in the future, is there some signal that you think is there that uh -huh. would separate? Push those out. Yes. Right. So I am very interested in this question. For those who are online, the question was, what happens to the EEG before and after uh, a, 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 a episode of delirium? What, what does it look like? Um, very interested in these questions. So it's, like I mentioned, very hard to know what happens before because people don't plan to come into the ICU usually. Um, so most of that work is being done in the, in the perioperative space, um, you know, uh, kept, you know, recruiting folks before they have a planned surgery, um, performing EEG and other, you know, other analyses on them, and then following them to see if they develop delirium post what they call postoperative delirium. Um, because there's a lot of work that also shows that postoperative delirium and postoperative cognitive decline are, um, are harbingers of, of poor prognosis later on. Um, I am not actually familiar with any uh, markers of the EEG that have been identified in the you know, preoperative space that predict postoperative delirium yet. Um, I have, there are some, some folks who are, are working on that currently um, and we will see. Um, as far as what happens after delirium, on the um, on the clinical side, in terms of if I'm an epileptologist reading the EEG, um, if the person is recovered, I'm generally seeing a normal EEG, or I might see some mild generalized slowing, so you know a little bit more delta power than than the average person, um, but not enough of a separation that I'd be able to pick that out necessarily. Um, and so I am very interested in that question as well. Um, we actually have an ongoing study, this is part of my, my K23, where we are, um, um, we're recruiting folks at the, as they are admitted to the, to the ICU. We're doing an EEG at the time of recruitment, at the time of enrollment. And then when they leave the ICU, we're doing another EEG. Um, so they've, you know, they've exited that hyperacute phase. Um, and then we're following them out for, for 12 months out and we're doing a you know formal cognitive evaluation then. So I hope to have the answer to you for you in a couple of years. Yes, Carolyn. So from a clinical perspective, I think sleep can function hugely in the time of the because EEG has to. Mm -hmm. Have you ever measured the amount of sleep disruption and tied it to an increase in delirium speed? So I haven't, but other folks have. Um, and um, it, it usually when they're not using EEG per se, but trying to use other measures of sleep. Um, so polysomnography is, you know, a whole, it's, you know, it includes EEG, but also all sorts of other electrodes and whatnot. Um, and what uh, folks have been able to identify is that increased sleep fragmentation um, is certainly associated with a uh, higher risk of delirium. Um, I have a colleague, Michaela Cordoza, uh, at uh, Vanderbilt, who is who is studying this again in um, in perioperative peri operative patients, um, because again, that's it's a little bit easier to sort of plan ahead. Um, but yes, that's an area of in intense interest. Um, it's really hard to um, to control sleep in the ICU, and um, and yet it's obviously very important. 
another thing that people are trying to do is um, sort of augment sort of normal sleep pharmacologically. So it's thought that, um, I don't know if you're familiar with dex dexmedetomidine or Presidex, um, that medication, when you give it to folks, their EEG shows a lot of faster frequency, you know, 12 to 15 hertz activity, which is akin to sleep spindles. Um, and the thought is, you know, maybe if we use this medication, then people will get some amount of sleep, you know, but the, um, and then improve, you know, delirium outcomes. Um, but the results have been um, varied. Uh, and so the optimal dose and timing of the dexmedetomidine probably makes a difference. Brian. Yes, different drugs will cause delirium. Yes. Do you think that there's a common mechanism? One of the things that gives me pause is that you can induce near delirium on dose of You can induce it by sleep deprivation. Mm -hmm. But often with stimulation, you can bring those patients back. They can attend. Mm -hmm. they answer Mm -hmm. So, do you think that there may be some common attention mechanism, failure mechanism that follows all the I think that, uh, so the question is, do we think that there's an attention network failure that could be the cause in, in multiple, mm -hmm, across multiple? Yes, yes. I actually don't. Um, it is possible. Um, but I think that the uh, different etiologies, um, that some of the etiologies probably group together, right? Um, inflammatory mechanisms probably, you know, group together. Uh, the hyperstimulation, the sleep deprivation um, etiologies probably group together. The, the drugs probably aggregate to some degree, but, you know, GABA agonists probably work slightly differently than anticholinergics probably work slightly differently than your toxins like cepapine. Um, and then electrolyte disturbances fit in there somewhere, maybe with the toxins or something. Um, I do think that, um, that the initial, like if, if we could capture delirium early enough, if we could identify it, um, almost before it's seen clinically, we might be able to identify the, you know, the single common, you know, common denominator, say the attention network, or, you know, the hypothalamus, you know, and the arousal systems or something like that, that goes awry before everything else starts, starts failing. Um, and that that might go awry in all, all of these, all of these um, etiologies, but, my suspicion is that there's a few different pathways, even in the context of, um, even in the context of, uh, you know, even if these these things aggregate somewhat, there's still a few, maybe two or three different pathways that that lead to delirium. Just my guess, but we will we will see in the future. Was there another question online? Two. Okay. So how may delirium signals okay yes so this is there is some work on delirium in and during and after stroke well during uh, delirium after stroke uh, um, being done by mike resnick um, and i don't think that he's looked at eeg signals um, the deal with stroke and eeg is that uh, as as you may know stroke um, involves a, 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 a disruption in the uh, blood flow to a specific area of the brain and causing that particular area of the brain to die, right? There's a blood clot, it clogs up the piping, blood can't get through, and then whatever was the downstream area of brain that was supposed to get that blood is now, um, is now dying off. Um, on EEG, what we see is 
uh, this delta activity, this slow activity that's specifically, you know, in that particular area. Um, so delirium during that time frame can be a couple of things. It can be a generalized slowing across the entire brain in in association with this focal slowing where that that particular area of brain is even worse, or it can be um, a focal slowing where that particular area of the brain is responsible, if you will, for the delirious picture that we see. So um, I remember learning in, um, in neurology residency that folks, some folks in particular with a right hemispheric stroke had higher likelihood of developing what looked like a delirious picture. Um, and whether that was just because I, you know, had worse difficulty communicating with them, it's not likely because, you know, the right hemisphere in that particular person was not their dominant hemisphere, but, um, but there was something about that, that area that made it more likely for them to have these fluctuations in arousal and periods of confusion. Thank you for this most informative presentation. Your statement about using wireless tech to advance this research is intriguing. How realistic is it? How realistic? Thank you very much for that question, Mom. Um, <laughs> that that's actually a really good question. So um, yes, <laughs> no, that's quite all right. I I love it. I I'm very thankful for my family and for my family support. It's actually more me that's outed, um, but. Um, the, uh, yes, so actually there is wireless EEG that exists today. Um, and so it is very realistic. The question is, can we get it uh, implemented in our ICU patients? Can we do those pilot trials? And can I get my EEG indicators, you know, built for those, those wireless, uh, wireless communications? Very good question. And I, and I think it's very realistic in the short term. Mom's ready to invest. Okay, <laughs> we can we can collaborate. I love it. Thank you, guys. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Yeah. It's so funny because you talked about the ability to start undergrading their theories from every. I they talked about how not being able to because people don't plan to go to the ICU, and so you can't get pre boarded function, and also the ability to or have control of placement of these channels. Are there folks looking at nursing homes? Because I know oftentimes um, delirium is associated with acute changes or illnesses within nursing homes. Are there, and if not, what are the barriers to doing studies within nursing homes? Oh, yes. So um, there is a lot of study of delirium in nursing homes. It's typically um, very um, pragmatic study in terms of you know delivery of care, uh, healthcare implementation. Not as much, to my knowledge, study of, for example, EEG or you know specific, um, um, I guess what I would say, uh, interventions um, or uh, research interventions in in the the nursing home uh, environment. Um, again, to my knowledge, um, there's a group uh, that's based in Boston. Um, the Sharon Inouye, I can't remember, oh my Lord, I, it begins with an H, it'll come to me in a moment. Um, there's a group in Boston who is um, really, really strong, really the, the mother of delirium research, um, who um, has done a lot of work uh, in uh, delirium assessment and prevention in the geriatric population, which you know obviously includes the nursing homes and really kind of getting it out to the, the community. Um, barriers to uh, implementation of you know specific research interventions one major barrier which is something that we experience in the icu um, is that uh, in those contexts uh, individuals are not necessarily able to um, uh, to consent for themselves to research and so you have to be very very you know cautious about making sure that you're not um, <clears throat> essentially being the mad scientist and performing research on you know, individuals who can't speak for themselves and can't escape the institutionalized environment to, you know, to to refuse. Um, 
in the ICU, we, um, we uh, as we're you know, performing our informed consents, we get special permission to you know, consent their authorized surrogate. And that's what you know, would be done uh, in the, the nursing home environment as well. But it's something to certainly be aware of. Um, and then there are other things, pragmatic things, just in terms of depending on your uh, technology of choice, um, your EEGs should be, if you're using EEG, for example, it should be portable, you know, being able to get it to uh, the location and, um, and, and, and flexible, essentially, so that you can uh, be able to move from room to room if you need to or, or those kinds of things. Um, but inherently doable, and it would be very interesting to, um, to uh, basically do large-scale trials, perhaps, right, of uh, doing EEG recording, brief EEG recording in all the nursing home residents, because eventually somebody is going to get sick and, and need to go to the hospital. So excellent point. Thank you. Did I answer all of the questions? I mean, you, I thought you had, you had, yeah, you had a couple of different notes. I want to make sure I address them all. Wait, that was all my question. I guess as a, for the people who investigate sleep, is there a difference between non-REM and REM sleep that's significant for early onset delirium? I don't know the answer to that. I'm looking forward to swap, so periodically past mm -hmm. sleep, so I don't know if it's possible, but if, if, you, if there is interest in looking at the difference the difference between non, yeah, so it would be really interesting to look at the difference between the effect of disruption to non-REM sleep versus the effect of disruption to REM sleep. Is that what you're referring to? And how that how that relates to uh, risk of delirium? Or more so that if people who are early, or, pre, or have early onset of delirium, if they have different like ratios of REM to non REM sleep. I see what you're saying. Yes, I think that that there may be, uh, and I'll I'll look into that, and I'll and I see if I can uh, send you something because I, I feel like I've seen uh, some studies of of in smaller you know groups of individuals um, that actually marked out what was considered to be sleep staging um, and um, and sort of distinguished REM from non REM, and I think it was the non REM sleep that was more um, predictive, but the ratio of REM to non-REM, I, I don't recall, but I'll, I'll see if I can find those studies and, and share them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you guys. Really appreciate your